All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Josh Steinle. And first order of business, I'm just going to pass around a stack of my name cards. So just take one and pass it on. And uh, it looks like I'm passing out a ton because these cards are pretty thick. But if they disappear before they get all the way around, there's more of them up here. And also before we get started, so I'm curious, is anybody here a Snapchat user? Does anybody use Snapchat? I know it's blocked, but does anybody use it? <laughs> Got one? Maybe one Snapchat user there? OK. Another one? So we've got at least two who admit it. So uh, real quick here, I'm just going to uh, take a little video of the class here to post to my story. This is going back to the US to my buddies there. So all right. Now they'll believe that I was actually here and that somebody actually cared about what I say. All right, there we go. So I'm super excited to be here. Uh, I live in Hong Kong. I've been up here to Shenzhen quite a bit, do some business here. And I know some of you from the Holt Prize competition a few months ago. And that was great. And uh, I love coming up here. It's a different experience than being in Hong Kong. It's a different type of city. And I like the variety. And I'm always surprised when I come up to Shenzhen how clean it is and how much is changing and how much is new here. Uh, I've been to other parts of China that aren't quite so clean and nice. But, uh, and maybe there are parts of Shenzhen that aren't quite that way. But I'm, I come up here and I always think, man, the streets are so big. and there are nice plants, and there's space. And then I go back to Hong Kong, and everything's cramped and small and <laughs> super, super expensive. The food up here is so cheap, and down there it's so expensive. Uh, so if you've been to Hong Kong, you know what I'm talking about. I just gave up on trying to save money there. It's just way too expensive, and I can't be bothered anymore with it. But I love coming up here, and I love getting uh, some of the food here. What do you call those uh, like street? crepe things. It's like bing or something. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's like kind of like a flat thing, and then they wrap stuff inside of it. Uh, bing. Like bing. bing. Yeah. What do you, what, what's that thing called? <laughs> How do you say it in, in Futonghua? What is it called? Bing. Bing? bing. OK, bing. Yeah, I love those things. Anyway. If you can tell me where to get one of those while I'm here, let me know, because I don't know where to get them. But every once in a while, I see a street vendor. I'm like, oh, I got to get one of those. I don't care what oil it's made with. So, uh, so to introduce myself a little bit more, so again, my name is Josh Steinle. I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. And I've been in Hong Kong for three years. Uh, I went to school in the state of Utah. Does anybody know where Utah is? Has anybody ever been to Utah? Salt Lake City, Utah? No? So it's a small state. It's got a population of about 2 million people. I lived there for 14 years. And while I was there at university, I started my business. And what my business is, it's called MWI. And it's a digital marketing agency. So we build websites for our clients. We do search engine optimization. We do content marketing. We do social media marketing. And I'll tell you a little bit about my story today about how I started that company and my experience doing it. Um, but I want to know a little bit more about you and your background and where you come from. So I'm curious here, is there anybody here who's actually from Shenzhen, who was born and raised here in Shenzhen? Anybody? We got one. All right. Because most people here in Shenzhen moved here from somewhere else, right? And most of you aren't even, well, a lot of you aren't even from China, right? So what are some of the countries that you're from that are not China? India. India. <laughs> Thailand. Thailand. I know we've got India or uh, Indonesia. <laughs> Where else? Pakistan. Okay. Pakistan. Turkey. Sorry, in up here? Turkey. Turkey. Germany. Germany. Where else? Tunisia? All right, great. So for those of you who are not from China, what brought you here? Well, how did you end up here? Just real quick, I'm just curious. Anybody care to tell me? How did you end up in Shenzhen of all places? Uh, OK. I ended up in Shenzhen or China. 
Well, both, I guess. Oh, I end up in China because I want to just see my master's degree. And then uh, initially I want to change to master's degree and then save for BTEC. But then my father forced me to learn Chinese in uni. <laughs> and then he forced me to, you don't need to do master's, just do Chinese translate because it's the most important language in the world. Uh -huh. So I, I got a trade for switching. I say, I'll do Chinese, I'll do the master's, so I pick China. And then after thought, thought of starting on all of the leaders of Sydney, I picked uh, Beijing University, and they have a branch in, in Shenzhen. So it's like, but aside of my father, um, forced me to um, be in China, but I actually, uh, I love Chinese because in my blood, the Chinese uh, descendant is very strong because uh, I'm a pure de Chinese descendant. Mm -hmm. so my grandparents, they are from Guangzhou province. So I have a kind of sense of belonging of China <laughs> that I am, because I even in my own country, they don't really look at me as an Indonesian citizen. Uh -huh. And I I even here, I, I have a good sense of belonging because I look alike Chinese. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is kind of coming back home for you. Yes. But your father forced you to do it. Yes. It sounds like you didn't want to do it. But now are you glad that you did yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I, I picked uh, to be Chinese rather than Singapore or US. Uh -huh. Anybody else? Anybody else want to volunteer how they ended up here, why they're here? So from Pakistan. Uh-huh. Great. Okay. So Shenzhen, it's a hot place, and you chose to came here, come here because of that. So these are two reasons that I'm so jealous of you guys, because one, I don't speak Chinese, and I wish I did. I wish so bad that I spoke Chinese, and I just don't have the time to invest to learn it, but every day when I go out and I'm around people who are speaking, whether it's Cantonese or Putonghua, I'm so jealous. I just think, oh, I just need to take three months and do nothing else and just take an intensive course and learn Chinese because it is part of the future. I mean, the world is gravitating towards three languages, English, Spanish, and, and Mandarin. And if you know any one of those languages, you have an advantage. If you know all three or two of those languages, you has, have a huge advantage over the rest of the world. So there's that language thing that really makes this a hot place to be. And then this other thing, Shenzhen, you might not know it being here. You often take for granted what's close to you, but this is a hot place. There are a lot of people coming from Silicon Valley here to do Internet of Things startups, to do hardware startups. You've got Hacks Accelerator here. Have any of you been over to Hacks? Have you taken a tour? Nobody? You should look it up, Hacks, H-A-X, Hacks Accelerator. It's a hardware startup place. They do Internet of Things startups there. But this is a hot thing, and there are students from Stanford, Berkeley, from the top universities who are coming here where you are because they want to get into these things. So take advantage of that. If you're into startups, if you're into starting a business, you're in a great place to do this. And you might not feel it being here. You might be like, well, Shenzhen, it's just kind of normal. It's where I live. It's just there's nothing special here, but there is something special here. And there are a lot of people who would like to be here who can't be here and you guys are here, so take advantage of that while you're here. So uh, let me tell my story, my background a little bit, and uh, then I'd love to open it up for questions. I'd like there to be some discussion. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. And if I'm talking and you have a question in the middle, please raise your hand, shout out, interrupt me, stop me. I'm happy to stop and talk more about anything that uh, you might be interested in. So, uh, and yes, this is my contact information. So that's my website, joshsteinley.com. Email josh at mwi.com. Feel free to email me. And then every social media profile I have is Josh Steinley. So that's WeChat, that's Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, most of which I know are blocked. But, and then you can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Facebook too when you uh, have your VPN up and running. 
How many of you, is this like a kosher question to ask? Like, how many of you use a VPN regularly? <laughs> OK, most of you, right? Um, what's the best VPN? I'm using VPN Ninja. Anybody have a be better VPN? Express VPN. Anybody think there's a better VPN than Express VPN? Depends on the day. Depends on the day, <laughs> yeah. There's the openly VPN. I use Sky Free VPN. Uh huh. Build Express Internet and others. In some towns, there's a period where all of them are free. Yeah. Express VPN always works on my computer. Yeah. Luckily. Well, VPN, VPN Ninja works pretty well for me, but yeah, I have three VPNs too, and some days none of them work. and some days they all work, some days one works. You're a tech guy, right? You put this together as a server from Amazon and uh, build your own VPN server. I guess the idea is expensive. Yeah. But I just come here every once in a while traveling, so I'm not, probably not motivated enough to set up my own. But uh, <laughs> And most of the time they work. It's just every once in a while something doesn't work. So well, anyway, all right. So uh, going back again, I was born in Los Angeles, California. I'm 40 years old. I was born in 1975. I'm from a different generation than all of you, I suppose. Uh, but I grew up around computers. My father was a rocket scientist, literally. He worked for NASA. He worked on satellites and telescopes as an optical engineer. If you've heard of the Hubble Space Telescope, that was his work for 10 years. And so when I was five years old or so, we got our first computer, and I grew up with that. And I learned how to do a little bit of programming in a language called BASIC. And it was basic programming in BASIC. And, but computers were normal for me. It was just something that was always around. And my dad was always upgrading to the latest and greatest computer, it seemed like. And so when the internet came out, he was one of the first people who had email. And I remember accessing websites in the very early days of the internet. And it's hard to communicate how different the internet is today from what it was back then. Back then, the internet was 500 websites, and they were terrible. I mean, think of the worst website you have ever been to. That was the whole internet. And there were 500 of those pages, or websites. And maybe each website had a few pages on it. And it was just a bunch of text thrown up that somebody had thrown up. And it seemed so cool, because somebody could throw up some text, and then you could type in an address, and you could get to it. And then what was there was kind of worthless. But it was just cool to be able to make these connections. And back then, nobody could have imagined what the internet would become today and how it would connect people and applications where we can talk to each other, see each other over video, where we can waste hours and hours and hours every day on social media. Nobody could have predicted this. And the opportunities that come from the internet nobody could have predicted. We're now see seeing the disruption of the entire banking system through fintech. We're seeing the dis disruption of the educational system through online courses. We're seeing all these industries, governments being disrupted, healthcare is being disrupted. All these industries are changing in fundamental ways such that 10, 15, 20 years from now, you'll look back and you'll tell your kids, Wow, when I was going to university, everything was so different than it is today. We used to have governments, and we had banks, and we had all these things, and now you just go online and all this stuff gets done, and it's so different than it used to be. Uh, the world will change more in the next 20 years than it's changed in the last 20 years, guaranteed. And a lot of this is being driven by the internet. It's being driven by data, big data, small data, all types of data. They're saying that the data revolution that's coming is going to be bigger than the internet revolution, bigger than the industrial revolution. And we're going to need tens of millions of data scientists in the next few years. Right now, we probably don't even have a million data scientists. We're going to need 50 million of those data scientists. Uh, Mark Andreessen, one of the uh, pioneers of the internet, created the Netscape browser. He's predicting that within a few years, every single thing that you own is going to have a chip in it whether it's your clothing, your watch, every single physical product will have a chip because they'll be so cheap. And we'll be getting data from every single one of those chips. And when you put all that data together, it's going to change the world because we're going to be able to find patterns that we've never been able to find before. So 
I grew up around computers. I couldn't have envisioned what the future would become. I was just there kind of living through all this. So I saw computers at kind of their most rudimentary stage where all you could do was type on a computer. And when I was doing programming in BASIC or my dad was doing programming in BASIC and showing it to me, our computer had something, I mean, it was less than a megabyte of RAM in it. And I mean, this phone was a supercomputer back then or the computing power that's in this phone was a would have been faster than a supercomputer back then. So we had this computer, and in order to write a program, you would write a program on the computer, and then you had to save it off of the computer because it was too big or something. And who even knows what a cassette tape is anymore? I mean, do you remember cassette tapes, like this thing that has tape inside of it and used to record music on it? You would get a cassette recorder and you would record your program from the computer onto a cassette tape, and then to run the program, you would play the cassette tape back into your computer. I mean, this is how it worked back then. This is how we would run programs. And then you fast forward today, and it's just, it's so different. I remember when my dad got a 20 megabyte hard drive. The entire hard drive on his computer had 20 megabytes on it. That was the whole thing. And his words, I remember this to this day, he said, I can't imagine how in the world I will ever fill this up. And I remember when he filled it up about a year later, and he said, well, I had to go get a backup drive, so I bought another 20 megabyte backup drive, but I'll never fill this one up. I mean, I filled the first one up, but I'll never fill up two of these. And of course, a year later, he filled that up, and now today I've got an external hard drive that's four terabytes. And so again, things have changed a little bit. So the internet kind of came into its own around 1996, 1997. I was in university at that time, so I was about your age when all this was coming out and the internet was really starting to explode and build up. And I had just spent two years in Brazil. I was a missionary down there for my church. And I came back from the Amazon jungle, kind of not having any experience with technology for two years. I mean, I was really out in the jungle. And I come back and this internet thing between 1994 and 1996 had really changed a lot. So I came back into university in 1997 and I looked at what was going on and I knew that I wanted to go into business but I also recognized that I really needed to understand technology and I needed to get an education and all this technology stuff. So I chose to study information systems management. It just seemed like the natural thing. It was half business, it was half computer science. And uh, the university I was going to had a master's degree in this where you could go for five years, get your bachelor's degree, your master's degree, your graduate degree in information systems management. And I'd sat down with a professor trying to get some uh, counsel or mentoring from him on what I should do and he said, hey, if you get this degree, you can go anywhere and you can do anything because you're going to be so in demand with this business side and this technical side. So I thought that sounded great, so I went and I got this degree. Well, while I was getting the degree, then this whole dot-com boom happened. And you guys are all too young, so you don't remember what it was like in 1999, 1998. But back then, I'm an old guy, and back then, this was an exciting time period because this is when the real internet applications started coming out. And this is when Amazon was born. And this is when eBay was born. These websites that are huge, Amazon's taking over the world right now. It's becoming the largest retailer. It will be over here. I mean, it, they are in China, but they're going to be huge here too. And so these companies were coming out and being formed and all these investors were just throwing money at these companies. So there were university students who didn't even have ideas and they would go to an investor and say, I don't even have an idea yet, but I'm a pretty smart guy and I'll come up with something. And the investor would give him $5 million US. The guy didn't even have an idea yet. I mean, that's how crazy it was. So during this whole dot-com boom, I had gotten into designing websites. I had an artistic background. I thought I was going to be an artist until uh, I switched into business. 
And so I thought I was going to be an artist. I got a job as a web designer. It allowed me to combine that technology stuff and the design stuff I loved. And I got a job working for a dot com. And I, we would sit in this small room in kind of a rundown office. We had folding tables. There were cables running all over the place. We had the big monitors, you know, the CRT monitors that are actually a big box. Man, flat screens back then. Uh, Nobody had flat screens. There was no such thing as a flat screen back then. So we had these huge bulky monitors and cables everywhere and slow computers that were connected to slow internet. And we were designing websites and we were building these internet applications. And the guys I was working for were just a year or two older than me and they had dropped out of college. Standard entrepreneur story. So they had dropped out of university and they were building this company and they were flying around and talking to venture capitalists and raising millions of dollars and they were hiring like crazy. I was number in, I was employee number 22 or something at this company and I was only there for five months and I saw it grow from 20 employees to 60 employees and it was just really exciting. And I watched this and I thought, I can't take this. I can't take just working for this company. I want to start a company like this. I want to run a business. It was just so exciting and it looked like so much fun. So I was designing websites for them and I thought, well, what could, it, could I do? What kind of business could I start? And I thought, well, I know how to design websites. People need websites. I'll just start a web design business. And I went to my boss and I said, hey, I'm going to quit. I'm going to start my own web design business. And he said, you don't want to do this. Don't start designing websites. You're going to hate it. You're going to hate a service business where you have clients and you only get paid when you do work. He said, you need to build an internet business where you can make money while you're sleeping and where it can really scale and grow quickly. And I said, well, yeah, maybe I'll get to that later, but I think I'll just do this web design stuff for now to get something started because I just want to do something. He's like, oh, don't do it, don't do it. Wait till you have some other idea. And I said, no, I'm going to quit now. I'm going to do this. And he said, oh, okay, whatever. He was right. But uh, 15 years later, I'm still doing the same business. We still do websites. We're still doing services for companies. And I've tried to start some of these other scalable businesses, and it hasn't worked out. But I left that company. When I left, they offered me more money to stay. They offered me stock options. And they offered me the very first stock options, which means they were the cheapest stop sh stock options. I could have basically got this stock in the company for free. And, but at the time, the company had 50, 60 employees, and they had almost gone out of business once. And I thought, nah, and they wanted me to drop out of school too, and I still wanted to stay in school. So I thought, no, nah, I'm going to quit this company because I don't even know if they're going to be around and I want to do my own thing and I need to stay in school. So I turned down the stock options, I turned down the pay raise and uh, I quit. Well that company went on to become uh, a pretty large software company that got bought out for 1.8 billion by Adobe Software and I would have had a bunch of shares from the very first stock option pool and my friends who stayed there, they bought houses and things and uh, anyway, I look back on that and I'm like, well, that was an interesting decision, you know, but I don't regret it. it I don't regret that I didn't, wasn't able to pay off a house. I kind of regret that I wasn't able to pay off a second house, which I probably could have done with that, but um, but I'm still glad that I went off and I did my own thing because what I've learned from being an entrepreneur and the fun I've had running my own business is worth more than the money I would have made staying at that company working for somebody else. So I left that company and I started designing websites. Now when I say I started designing websites, I started designing websites but the problem was nobody knew who I was and nobody wanted to pay me any money. I thought that when I started a business people would just appear out of nowhere and give me money and it didn't work. I started this business, I set up a website and then nobody called me and I realized, well yeah, they don't know who I am. They don't know how to find me. They don't even know I exist. And so basically I starved for a couple months. I had no income. I had just gotten married. I was at university. And here I am, I'm sitting in my apartment in front of a computer waiting for the phone to ring for somebody to hire me. I started talking to everybody I knew and finally I got one job and I made a little bit of money on that. 
and then I got another job and I made a little bit more money on that and I got another job and every time I would get a new job I'd make a little bit more money on each job and after about five or six months it actually started going pretty well. I started to get word of mouth business. I was doing okay and then I started to make really good money. I mean really good money for a university student and so if leaving that other company might have been kind of a mistake, it was definitely a mistake financially. Uh, if that was my first mistake, my second mistake was when I said, you know what, I could turn this into a real business. Not just me freelancing, not just me doing work by myself, but I could hire people on to do work with me. Because I thought, hey, I'm making good money here. I could pay other people to do this and they'll just grow. So I went out and I hired five people and I got an office. And then I put these people in this office and the same thing happened that had just happened to me where I had quit my job and then I sat there for three months without any work. I put these five people in an office and after one month I realized I'm not making enough money to pay all these people. And the business is not just coming in. I'm making enough money to pay myself really well but not to pay all these people really well. So after one month, I had to let three of those five people go. And it just I thought, man, I'm an idiot. What, kind, what am I doing? Why did I hire these people on when I can't pay them? But I just thought the business would come in from nowhere, and it didn't. So over the next two and a half years, I brought on two partners. We struggled, but then things kind of grew. And after about two and a half years, we were doing pretty well again. And the business had grown. We were really well recognized for the work that we were doing. And we had a good thing going except I had a partner and he and I didn't get along. And one of the mistakes I made, again, another mistake here was I had found a partner and I brought him in as a partner, gave him 10% of the business after I had known him for about 10 minutes. So I met this guy, somebody else referred him to me and said, hey, you should meet the, my friend, he seems like a great guy, I bet he'd do good at sales. I met him, we sat down after 10 minutes, I was like, hey, you want to be part of our business, have 10% of it, do sales for us? He's like, sure. And we went into business together and then six months later we realized we don't really get along so well. He's a great guy, nothing against him, but I was naive, I was immature, and we we're both college students, so we're both studying, we've got other things going on, we're trying to start this business and we're not making enough money, so it's kind of stressful and we just didn't see eye to eye. And in retrospect, it was 95% my fault and maybe 5% him, but it was mostly my fault. And so after two and a half years of working together, I just wanted to get out of this partnership and I thought, no, oh, if I could do things my way, then everything would be working out great and it'd be even better than it's going. So after two and a half years, a company came along and they offered to buy us out and I thought, hey, this is a great way for me to get out of this partnership, make some money selling the business, and then I can start over and do it the right way and do it the way that's going to grow really fast. So we talked to this company. We never got any other offers. We never solicited any other offers. We just thought, oh, this is a great offer. This company was listed on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. They were acquiring companies left and right. They had 200 employees. They had all this money. And they were offering us like all this stock in their company, no cash, just stock. But it sounded like such a great deal. I was looking at the stock and I was thinking, okay, they're on the NASDAQ. I can see what the stock is worth right now. And now there was a limitation on the stock. I couldn't sell it for one year. But I thought, hey, what's going to happen in a year? I'll get this stock and a year from now I'm going to sell this for a million or two million dollars and I'm going to be rich and then I can start my next company and do it the right way. So we did this deal. This company took my company. My partner went to work for them. All my people went to work for this other company. Uh, and we signed all this paperwork and then I went and I restarted my company from scratch all over again. And that's MWI. That's when the name MWI came into being. So this was 2003. Well, a year later, that company that bought out my company was bankrupt. And my stock was worthless. And on top of that, they had taken all of our computer equipment, all of our furniture, which we were still paying for. We had leases on this equipment. And my name was on all those leases. And they said, we're not going to pay on these leases. We're going to keep the equipment, but we're not going to pay the leases. 
So all the companies came after me to get the money to pay for that stuff. So I'm thinking, wait a second. I don't have this stuff. I gave it to these guys. Why do I have to pay for this stuff? So I'm going to the company saying, you guys have to pay these leases. And they're saying, we're bankrupt. We're not paying anything. And I said, well, I'm going to take it. And they said, no, you can't take it. We own this stuff. You signed it all over to us in these papers. And I said, well, I hate you then. And they said, <laughs> we don't care. Everybody else hates us too. We've got 40 other people who hate us. And I said, well, I'm going to come get it anyway. And they said, we'll call the police and they'll arrest you. And I was like, oh, man. And so in essence, I not only gave away my company, because all I got was a certificate that said I owned a bunch of shares in this other company. I still have the certificate. But I got that piece of paper for my company. And then on top of it, I had to pay off all these debts for that company. So I ended up losing about $40,000 US on this deal. I gave my company away, and I had to pay somebody $40,000 to take my company, which was profitable, which was making money. So that was another lesson learned. That was a bad bad deal. So after that I said, man, that's it. I'm never going to have a partner again. This is all because I brought on a partner and I brought him on too fast and I didn't know what I was doing. So I'm just never going to have a partner again. So with my new business now, I thought, okay, I'm going to run this by myself and it's going to be great and I'm going to invest in all these things and it's going to grow fast. And so I did all th the things my way. I had 100% control, 100% ownership, and I went out and I just failed miserably with the new business. From 2003 to 2007, I didn't get paid a dime by my business. For four years, I could not pay myself anything. My wife was working. We lived off of her income, which was not a lot. Uh, so we lived really poor. And we, it was just terrible. And I kept thinking every day I would wake up and I'd go into the business and I'd say, there's so much potential here. And yet it's not happening. It's not succeeding. What am I doing wrong? And what do I need to learn? And every month I would look back and I'd say, boy, I was an idiot a month ago, but now I've learned so much just in the last month. Now I'll get it right. And then the next month I'd be saying the same thing. Oh, I was an idiot last month, but now I know what I'm doing. And this just went on from month to month to month. And that's what kept me going. I kept thinking, well, maybe I should give up on this. And my parents would say, maybe you should give up on this. And my friends would say, maybe you should give up on this and get a real job. And I'd say, no, no, it's almost going to work out. We're almost there. We just need this to happen and this to happen. And if this happens, then everything's going to be great. And then those things wouldn't happen. But they'd almost happen. And that just kept me going for four years. So for four years, I didn't pay myself. I had employees. They got paid most of the time. Sometimes they got paid really late. Um, and sometimes in order to pay my employees, I couldn't pay other things like taxes. And I don't know how it is here, but in the US, if you don't pay your taxes, then the IRS, the tax collection agency, comes after you. And they speak really kindly to you. But they also say things like, you know, we're going to work this out with you. We were gonna pay, we're going to put you on a payment plan to pay these taxes back. And it's a really great plan. Oh, by the way, if you don't pay it, we're going to put you in jail. And so the tax collection agency was coming after me because I hadn't paid my taxes because I was looking at the money. And I was like, well, I can pay taxes or I can pay my employees. If I don't pay my employees, they're going to quit. My business is done. If I don't pay the taxes, well, maybe I've got six months before they put me out of business. So I'm going to pay the employees and not the taxes. And so I did that for nine months. And then the IRS came after me. And I said, OK, I guess I better pay the taxes now. So I was making just one mistake after another. And I was learning all sorts of great lessons. And it was really educational and fun in a way. Uh, I mean, I was getting a really thorough MBA through direct experience. But it just wasn't working out. I wasn't making any money. I was miserable. I was working 100 hours a week. I was sleeping on the floor of my office. I, was, uh, I got zero exercise because I just didn't move. I sat in front of a computer, and I got really fat and unhealthy. I was eating terrible food, and just everything was just miserable. So at the end of 2007, or at the end of 2006, right before 2007, I thought, I'm ready to quit. I'm just dying here. I've got to do something. I've got to find a way out of this. 
And I'd always wanted to go back and get an MBA from Harvard. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to go apply for that MBA from Harvard right now. Which I don't know why I think I thought I was going to get in. I mean, I was running a failed business. I had nothing to impress Harvard with, but I just thought, oh, they'll be so impressed because I'm this struggling entrepreneur and there's something noble about this and Harvard's going to love this. So I, I went to all this work, filled out this Harvard MBA application and turned that in, waited a few months and then January of 2007 I got this letter back from them saying, uh, we're not interested in you. And that was just the low point. That was just like the final blow where I was just like, I sat there and I was holding this letter and I just thought, man, what is wrong with me? I've got this failed business. I'm fat. I'm sick. I'm unhealthy. Nobody likes me. Harvard hates me. Uh, what am I doing here with this business? What am I doing with my life? I didn't see my wife ever. My wife, I mean, she was very patient with me. I think a lot of other women would have just been like, I'm sick and tired of this, I'm out of here. But she stuck with me. But it was just this terrible experience. And I thought, I thought entrepreneurship was supposed to be fun. And I was watching other people start businesses. And in two years, they were making $50 million a year. And it was just going really well for them. And I'm sitting there thinking, what, what is wrong with me? Why am I such a failure at this? So in 2007, I sat down and I thought, okay, it's time to get real with this. I got to do something different. And uh, I didn't know what to change with the business, but I thought, you know, one thing that's within my control is I can get healthy. I can start eating right. I can go to the gym. That's something I know will work and know will do the right thing. So I started eating better. I started going to the gym, started working out, started losing weight. And a funny thing happened. A few months later, I was talking to a friend of mine and he started giving me some advice on the business. And he introduced me to a, kind of a self-help course that I went through. And I went through this and I realized a few mistakes that I was making with the business. Things like having an office space that was really expensive when I can't even pay the employees. And having a business where I'm dependent on clients paying me and our revenues would go up and down based on projects that we'd get in. So we'd get a big project, revenues go up. Then the next month, we did our revenues are way down because we don't have another big project to replace it. And I started realizing, you know, it'd be better to have a business where we have recurring revenue, where we can actually predict how much money we're going to make. And it would be better if my employees were compensated based on how much money we're bringing in. And why do I have this office that I'm paying so much money for? Is it that we need an office or is this just feeding my ego because it makes me feel like I'm successful if we have this big office? So I started making decisions. I got rid of the office. I put all my employees on contract so I only paid them when they were actually working on paying projects. And within two months, I went from going into debt every uh, month and I had accrued about half a million dollars U.S. in debt. So that's how far I was in debt. And I was personally liable for this. And I was looking at this, I'm like, how am I ever going to pay this off? This is going to take me 30 years to pay off. Well, I went from getting into debt every month to within about two months, I started paying off ten or $20,000 a month U.S. in debt with a few simple changes to the business. And I thought, okay, this is some level of success. Now, the decisions I had to make to improve it were hard. I had to get rid of that office, which was a hard thing for me to do. I had to let employees go. That was really hard for me to do. Uh, it was really a big hit to my ego because people could see that I wasn't doing so well all of a sudden. During all those years when I wasn't getting paid, everybody thought I was doing really well. I had put on a great image, which is good, right? I'm a, I run a marketing firm. We should be able to make ourselves look good, and we did make ourselves look good, but behind the scenes, everything was terrible. Well, everybody thought I was doing really well, and suddenly I had to admit publicly, we're not doing so well. We have to get rid of our office. We have to let all these people go, and that was really a blow to my ego. So, but it was the right thing to do, and it was the only thing to do to survive. So for the next few years, I just worked out of my house, and I said, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to figure out what's going wrong with this. And after a few years of contracting, I'd paid off a lot of debt. Things were going well. 
and I thought, I'm ready to grow again. I'm ready to try again at growing this business because I'd basically scaled down to just myself and then some contractors, but I wanted to have that business again, but do it the right way this time. And I recognized that one of the weaknesses my business had was that we didn't have anybody who could really sell what we did. Now remember when I started my business, what did I do? When I first quit working for that other company, the dot com, and I started my own business, I sat down and I thought, well, I know how to design websites really well, so people will just magically find me and hire me. And then they didn't, because nobody was doing sales. Nobody was going out and selling what we did. And when I hired those employees on for the first time, and I thought, clients will come to us and they'll magically hire us, and then they didn't. I didn't have anybody out there selling. I had never really had anybody who could go out and sell what we did. So I started looking for somebody who could do sales. And I backed off of my commitment to never have a partner again. I said, I want to find a partner, and I want to find a partner who knows how to sell. So for a year, that's all I did. I searched for somebody who could sell really well. And after a year, I found that person. His name's Corey Blake. And so in 2012, 2013, end of 2012, uh, I talked to Corey Blake. He started working for me. And around the same time, I w was uh, contacted by Forbes magazine, and they asked me to start writing for them. I had been blogging for 10 years and just writing about all my business failures and all the experiences I was going through and all these lessons I was learning. And nobody really cared to read all this stuff. Nobody likes reading stuff about failure, really. It's not very inspiring to read somebody complaining and whining about how bad things are for them. And that's mostly what I wrote. But Forbes liked some of the stuff I had written, and they said, hey, we want you to start writing for Forbes. So I started writing for Forbes, and then I started writing for other publications. And at the same time, Corey Blake came on and started doing sales for us. Well, the combination of me writing for Forbes started bringing in a lot of leads as people learned about my business, and then Corey started closing these deals. And so within about a year, our revenues grew a thousand percent and we just started growing like crazy. We started hiring people on and we started building the business, but now it was different than the other times. Now for the first time, we were hiring people because we had work for them to do rather than saying, I'm going to hire people and then I'll find work for them to do. We already had the work and we needed people to get it done. And so fast forward to today, we've got 15 people full time. We have about 20 or 30 contractors that we use on a regular basis. And the business is growing quickly and it's a very different experience from what it was before. And now we're on track to, we're doing way more in revenues than we ever did before. We're growing quickly in a way that we've never grown before. And we have an outlook for the future that's very different from what we ever had before. And it's because we made some very simple changes in the business from how it was run before. Things like having somebody who knows how to sell, only hiring people when we have work for those people to do and the money to pay them. Um, and we don't waste money on office space. We don't have any office. We have 15 people. We have no office. Everybody works remotely because we don't need an office. So there are a lot of things that we're doing differently, but they're really small, minor things. But it's made all the difference in terms of being profitable or unprofitable. One of the things I learned running a business is if, if you're making just a little bit more than your business spends, it's heaven. It's paradise. And if you're making just a little bit less than the cost of running your business, it's hell. It's terrible. It's the worst thing in the world. And it might be a difference of just a few dollars, a few RMB, whatever. But that little difference makes all the difference in your stress levels, your anxiety, how you feel emotionally. So I know I've been talking for a while now, and we're, we're wrapping up at 1230, right? Yeah, 1220, 1230. Oh. <laughs> okay. So I apologize. It got carried away there. but. Uh, now, I'd love to just answer any questions you have about entrepreneurship. I'm involved in the entrepreneurship scene in Hong Kong. I uh, co-host an organization there called Startup Grind. And through Forbes and through the other publications I write for, I've been able to interview a lot of successful entrepreneurs and investors. 
And so I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about marketing, about entrepreneurship, about startups, about Hong Kong, about the US, venture capitalists, or anything. So who's first? Yes. So I have a couple of questions, but as the time is short, I will just try to wrap them up. So when you started your company, I feel that from this whole discussion that that HR, business development, these are all three of the components which are obviously needed. But when you are a startup company, you don't have any employees. And then you say, why do I need an HR person? Why do we need a new, new team of people who is doing the strategy? Mm -hmm. So how do you take care of all these things as a startup company? Or what do you do? It's we hire people when we are desperate for that person. And it becomes obvious who we need to hire. Mm -hmm. The way I did it in the old way was, oh, big companies, they have a CFO, they have this person, they have this person, so I need those people. And that's not the way it works in a startup. You don't hire the people you think you're going to need. You hire people when you actually need them. And so in our company, we start having problems, and then that tells us who we need to hire. So we're starting to have issues around HR right now, where it just takes a lot of time to manage health care and taxes and recruiting and onboarding and training and all these things. And it's getting to the point where we're realizing there's almost enough justification here for a full-time person to do this. Therefore, we know that we're just about ready to hire an HR director because it's just becoming more and more obvious. So that's how we hire, really, is we know we're going to hire all these people in the future, but we know when it's the right time to hire because we start having problems centered around not having that person in the business. Yes? Yeah, so, so how do we manage it when clients don't know what they want? Yeah. yeah, so yeah, we do have clients who come to us and they want a website or they, we had somebody come to us last week and she is a celebrity chef in Hong Kong. And she said, I'm the, a chef, I've got a cookbook, I've got 330,000 followers on Facebook. Uh, anytime I put a video up on YouTube, it gets 10, 20, 30,000 views within a month. But I have no idea what to do with all this stuff. She's not making any money off of this audience she has. These people want to buy things from her, but she has no idea what to do. She doesn't know anything about websites, about social media. She's just kind of done this on her own, and she got lucky, and she uh, got some parts of that right. So, so she comes to us, and then we set up her strategy, and we say, OK, we can help you make money off of YouTube ads. We can help you sell more of copies of your cookbook. We can set up courses that you can sell to people. So yeah, we'll sit down with clients like that, and we come up with their strategy, and we help them through it. A lot of other clients, they know exactly what they want. They just need somebody to do it. So they come to us, and they say, hey, we, we need a social media advertising campaign to sell our app, and we're just out to hire, and we'd like a bid from you, and we're going to get bids from five other companies that do this, and give us your best shot. So. Okay, so the question is, how do you figure out pricing for what you do, essentially, right? Okay, so how do you standardize the pricing model for something? Well, there are a few ways you can do this. One, you look at what the competitors charge, and you say, well, they're charging this. I'll charge the same as the competitors do. So that's one option. And my advice with that is don't try to compete on price. Always compete on value, because as soon as you compete on price, you lower your price, they lower their price, and then it's a race to the bottom. 
and then nobody's making any money and it's terrible. So you don't want to do that. We always go into a market and when we introduce a new service, we charge more than all the com competition and then we tell all our clients we're charging more because we're better than everybody else. So that's how we sell on value. And that way we don't end up in this competitive numbers game. Uh, the other side is if you're selling some, now that works for some things, but for other things you might just be introducing something that's kind of new and you just have no idea what it should be priced at because nobody's really doing it or nobody's doing it the way that you're doing it. Uh, of course you've got to make money, so you know you have to work out your costs and you have to figure out, well, if I don't make this much, then I'm going to lose money, so I have to charge more than that. And hopefully you know what your costs are. Um, but, for example, if you're selling some sort of SaaS service, some software package, and you're trying to decide, well, should I charge 100 RMB a month or should I charge 200 RMB a month? And there are people out there, competitors, and they're charging all sorts of different prices and you're trying to figure out well, which one is right. I'm not sure. Uh, my advice would be always start out higher and then go lower because if you start out higher, it's really easy to adjust the price down. Nobody complains about that. Everybody's happy. If you start out lower and then you try to double the price, you're going to get a lot of complaints and a lot of people quitting at that point. So, I mean, you start higher. And then if it's not working out, then you can go lower. Um, a great way to figure this stuff out, though, is if you're selling, do you have a service or a product? Um, technically, the product is what I'm using right now. Mm -hmm. But I actually invest uh, like in the Okay, so the final deliverable is a video, a marketing video, but you're providing the service of creating those videos, right? So it's not like you're making one video and then selling that same video a hundred times, right? You're creating every video from scratch. Okay, so it's really a service. So, so yeah, I would compare that to the competition. Look at what other people are charging. Charge more. Try to increase your value, the quality, so that you're better than your competitors and sell on that value. Uh, that's the way that really makes sense to sell within that business model. That's the same thing that we do. We provide a service and it's the same type of thing. You check yourself against the competition. Now we get people coming to us all the time and they say, you charge two or three times what this other guy charges. And that's ridiculous. We've had people get mad at us because of what we charge. I mean, I don't know, if I go to buy something from somebody and I don't like the price, I just don't talk to them again. I just Go find it somewhere else if I think it's a bad price. We've had people get offended where they come back and they're like, that's ridiculous. How can you dare to charge that much? I'm like, if you don't like it, nobody's forcing you to buy it. Like, you can just go get it somewhere else. But it's like they're mad about it. Um, but we, we tell people, hey, we're better than the competition. We do a better job. And that's the way I really recommend selling it. So price yourself high and then sell on quality. And of course, you have to have better quality to sell on quality, but make sure that you're a better option than the competition. Add more value to it. All right. Can we just keep going until people want to leave, or how do you want to? Yeah. We can do that. Yeah, if, people, if you guys need to go and you can take off, um, and maybe finish up uh, all together in a couple minutes, if you do need to get lunch before the next class as well. So yeah. Okay, okay. So maybe maybe let's give it five or ten more minutes, and then we'll wrap things up. And yeah, if you need to go, just leave whenever. And and again, if you got my name card, then you can email me. You've got the contact info there, so you can always ask me more of these questions on email. I'm happy to answer them there. But who who's got the le next question then? Yes. Yeah, so starting your own business. General advice on starting a business and whether you should have work experience before or just dive in and start it right now. Well, based on my own experience, starting a business as a new university student, 
if I haven't already talked you out of doing that based on the story I just told you, then yeah, my advice would be I think there's something to be said for going and getting a little bit of work experience first. Now I did have some work experience. I'd worked for a few other companies. I worked for this startup. Uh, unfortunately, working for that startup kind of gave me an artificial sense of success and how easy it would be because these people were raising venture capital money, so they were getting millions of dollars, and so everything looked like it was just amazing. And I thought that would happen to me, not realizing how that worked and how that game worked. So it's easy to look at people starting businesses and think, oh, this is really easy, I'll just go do it. And if I had graduated and then I went to work for another company for a year or two, I would have learned a lot about how a business is run and how it should be run and how it shouldn't be run. And I could have taken that into my business then and started a few years later. And I think that really would have benefited me. I think it hurt me to never have worked in the type of business that I went out and started because I had to figure everything out on my own and I couldn't think back to prior experience and think, oh, well, when I used to work at this other agency, they always did this part and that was totally wrong. I saw how that didn't work out, but they did these things right and I saw how that worked out really well. I couldn't do that because I didn't have that experience. And I feel like I missed that. At the same time, starting a business while I was in university was so educational and fun. I mean, despite all that bad stuff where I told you that I didn't make money for four years, and I was working 100 hours a week and I was dying and I mean despite all of that it was still really fun and exciting I was still having a great time I mean I was crying sometimes but I was still having a great time even when I was crying so it's I'm a little bit torn on that because no matter what you do you can have a great experience whether you work for somebody else whether you start your own business you can turn that into an amazing experience either way if I were going back and doing it over again, I probably would go get some work experience first for a year or two in the type of business that I'm thinking of starting. And I might do that, maybe if I had done that for a year or two, I never would have even started the business I'm in. Maybe I would have said, ah, oh, man, that's a pain. I'm going to go start something else. Well, that's a good lesson to learn. By the time I was two years into it, I couldn't get out of it. I was stuck in it. I had all this debt that I had to pay off. So I didn't have that choice anymore. So. Uh, if you're looking to start at the same time, I don't want to discourage anybody who has an idea and they say, oh, I really want to start this now. I don't want to discourage people from starting that. But I would say definitely if you're thinking of starting a business as a university student, get educated on what it means to start that business and how to do it. What you have that I didn't have back then was there weren't books on how to start businesses back when I was starting my business. I mean, there were a few, but they weren't very good and they weren't, they weren't geared towards startups. It was more people coming out of big businesses saying, here's how you run a big business. Well, a big business is a very different entity than a startup. Today, you've got all sorts of data and research and studies and people with lots of great experience writing books about how to do a startup. So you have books like Lean Startup by Eric Ries, and you have The Founder's Dilemmas by Noam Wasserman, and you've got, um, uh, they're just all these great books about how to create a startup that didn't exist when I was starting my company. So go read those books and then it gives you a more, more of a sense of reality. Oh, read the hard, thing by, uh, the hard Thing About Hard Things by Ben Horowitz. That book is, that'll scare you if uh, you're thinking about starting a business. If you can read that book and you still want to start a business, that's a good sign that you might be an entrepreneur. So. Um, <laughs> But read those books and then read all the articles and read all the stuff that people are saying because there's so much information out there now to help you create a business that did not exist 15 years ago when I was starting my business. Yes? Yeah, my question is, what's your motivation for expanding to China? I mean, uh, did you encounter some challenges in the U.S. or uh, did, did you think that you already done well in the U.S. and you want to tap into a new market? Um, actually, I'm here for reasons that have nothing to do with business, uh, which is my wife and I, a few years ago, we decided we were going to adopt a child, and we started looking at adopting from China. And then because I'm kind of crazy, that just turned into a discussion where I turned to my wife one day. I'm like, why don't we just move to China? That'd be fun. And she's like, okay. 
So we, uh, we actually just up and moved here. Well, then we decided that China was a little bit too much of a big step. So we said, well, why don't we move to Hong Kong? That's a little bit safer. And uh, so we moved to Hong Kong. And we thought, you know, it's right across the border from China. We're close, but we're not too close. And uh, so we thought, let's move to Hong Kong, and then maybe we'll uh, eventually make it into China. So we moved to Hong Kong, and we're working on this adoption right now. And, but that's what brought us over here. Starting the business over here in Hong Kong or over here in Asia was really just because I had to start an office to get my visa in Hong Kong. They wouldn't let me into Hong Kong unless I opened an office. And so I said, well, that wouldn't hurt. Let's open an office too. So we opened an office in Hong Kong. And uh, now that's kind of getting to the point where it's really taking off and it's becoming fun business-wise and lucrative business-wise. So yeah, that's the story there. Sorry, I keep skipping past you. Yes. As a person, it's somehow you up and it's very down. How, how do you keep up like so many years, even until now, uh, how, how do you motivate yourself to still like get in track? So the way that I motivate myself or find motivation is, one, I, I have a mission behind the business that's more than just making money. For me, it's not about making money. Uh, if I make money, that's great, that's fun. When I see money come into the bank account, it's kind of like points in a video game. It's like, oh, somebody likes us, somebody likes what we're doing. And, but it's not really, I, I don't care about the money, I don't care about what money can buy. It's more, I want to create something and I want to create something successful and do it the right way. I want to treat clients right. I want to work with a team that's fun to work with and I want to see people grow. So there are all these motivations around that. And really, it's a lot of it is personal growth and education. And just it's fun to learn. And I've never learned so much as running a business. Every other job I've had in my life, I either quit within five months or I was fired. Because I would get bored. I'd work for somebody else. And I would kind of optimize that job to where I said, well, that's all I can do. And then you go to your boss and you're like, I want to do something else. And he says, no, you do this. And so I'd be like, OK, I'm out of here. I quit. Or I'd get, or I just wasn't a very good employee either. either. I made all sorts of mistakes, and that's why I'd get fired. So uh, I thought, you know, I need to start my own business, because then nobody can fire me. And, uh, <laughs> and the other side of it was I knew that I would keep learning things. And that's the thing is, I've been doing this for 15 years. It's the same business, and yet every day there's something new, and I'm learning so much all the time, even after 15 years. And that's a lot of the motivation. Another part of it, though, is with all the ups and downs and those challenges, I really got negative for a few years there, where I was very p pessimistic. I just felt like no matter what I do, nothing works out. It's hopeless. This is terrible. This business stinks. I had a guy that worked with me and we turn to each other all the time we're like we talk about some challenge we're going through and we're like man this business just is terrible like why did we go into this business this business stinks and um at one point i just when i kind of hit rock bottom that really terrible period back in 2007 i just made a decision i said i'm going to be happy i don't care what whether things are bad or they're good i'm just going to be happy no matter how things are and I just made that conscious decision. And I said, even when things are really going bad, I'm going to be happy and I'm going to enjoy it. And I'm going to look on the bright side of things. And I discovered, you know what? You're about as happy as you choose to be. And so um, that's what keeps me positive these days. Even when things are bad, I'm like, oh, this is terrible. I have to fire this person. Or I have to deal with this issue. Uh, this client hates us. They want a refund. No matter what's going on, I just say, you know, this is great. I'm alive. I'm learning. This is a new experience that I can grow from, and I can get better, and that's great. So that keeps me motivated. Why don't we do one more question, and then we'll end it there. Last question. Sorry. You, I can talk to you afterward, but. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry, no. Uh, your work that oh, um, what exactly do we want to know about Forbes? Ah, uh, yes, that's the question. Everybody wants to know. Well, how do I write for Forbes? Yeah, so uh, you've heard the saying, it's not about what you know, it's about who you know. Well, that's how I got the gig writing for Forbes, is I knew somebody who wrote for Forbes. I asked her, how did you do this? How do I do this? And she said, oh, I'll introduce you. And she introduced me to her editor, and I got into that after he had seen my writing. Now, uh, the way, th here's kind of the secret behind the publishing industry is it's, it's not run the way that you think it is, the whole editorial industry. And if you want to read a really interesting book on this, there's a book called Trust Me, I'm Lying by Ryan Holiday. And he exposes the dark side of journalism and the, this whole industry. But these are businesses. And we often think about journalistic integrity and people are writing things that they really care about. And there is that side of journalism. But there's also this side of journalism where people are just making money and they're trying to make money and they're trying to boost their egos and they're trying to be successful. And journalists want to write stuff that people read. So um, Forbes is a business publication and they run a business and they want to get as many people on that website as possible. So they figured out, well, hey, it's expensive to pay people to write, but we've got this brand, Forbes, and people want to write for Forbes, and we think people would write for Forbes for free. So a few years ago, they created this contributor model. So the writing that I've done for Forbes is as a contributor. I couldn't even call myself a writer, and I actually don't write for Forbes now as of like two months ago, but um, I had to call myself a contributor in anything I said publicly. I couldn't call myself a writer because those are the people who get paid. So Forbes has four or 500 people who get paid to write. These are staff writers. And then they have about 1,500 people who write for free for Forbes. And these people are willing to write for free for Forbes because of what they get out of it. So over a three-year period, I wrote 164 articles for Forbes, and I didn't get paid a dime for that. They didn't give me any money for that. But I got paid in other ways. It grew my business. I got a book deal out of that. My first book is coming out in a month. Um, I got notoriety. I got a little bit of fame, or it was a boost to my ego. And people write for Forbes for all these different reasons. And so if you want to write for Forbes or any other publication, uh, my first advice is, it's easier to start small. So you can go to local publications and you say, hey, I just want to get experience writing. I'd like to donate articles I'll write for free. I just want to get that experience. That's a great way to start. Before you even do that, though, you need to have some samples of writing. And so I was already blogging for 10 years. I had 900 posts on my blog. So I could go and show and say, hey, here's a bunch of my writing that I've done. And they could look at that. And that's what he, the editor looked at. And he said, I want you to write the same stuff you're writing on your blog but you're going to publish it on Forbes now. So that's how I got in there, is I had some samples of my writing before. But if I were doing it again, I'd be publishing on my blog, I'd be publishing on LinkedIn Pulse or anywhere else. Anywhere that you can publish, I would get in there. And then I would go to smaller local publications, and I would say, hey, I want to write for free just to get the experience. And because everything's online, there's no limit to what they can publish. If it's a newspaper, the editor's not going to give you space in that newspaper or that magazine unless you're really good. But online, he can throw up anything. And the more he puts on his website, the more traffic he gets, the more advertising he sells. So they have an incentive to just bring in as many writers as they can within reason when it comes to quality. And so that's why Forbes has 1,500 free writers is it builds their business. And they got bought out for $400 million US or something by some Hong Kong investors last year. So it worked out really well for them. So, uh, so yeah, if you're interested in that, I can give you more information too on how to do that. Thank you, everybody. I I've loved being here and chatting with you. And uh, again, I'm happy to answer any other questions you might have by email. Thank you.